Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. A mobile home park in the East Valley must make safety improvements or shut down. We'll talk about what is being done to help residents. And in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, learn about a new art gallery that will feature local artists from throughout Arizona. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thanks for joining us. The City of Mesa wants Mesa Royale Mobile Home Park to make safety improvements or shut down in October. More than 100 families will lose their homes if the list of code and safety violations is not addressed. Joining us to talk about the situation is Maria Paletta, an Arizona Republic reporter covering issues in Mesa, Jerry Lewis, family trustee for the Ham Family Trust, Mesa Royale Mobile Home Park owner, and Enrique Ochoa Medina, executive director for the Arizona Fair Housing Center. Thank you all for joining us on Horizonte tonight. Um, Jerry, I want to start with just a little bit of history of the ownership of the park. And, and, and while we're doing that, we've got some pictures of, of the park that, that we're going to run. But um, as I understand it, the current owner, the, the family trust, it, it, it's relatively new. Gene Ham was running the place for a number of years, and, and then the family bought it. He's been running the place uh, for at least 30 years. And as of the fall of 2014, became the title owner of the property. And then, uh, but, but uh, uh, he's making efforts right now to sell it. And as I said, we're going to run some pictures. We've got one right there on, on the screen and, and a few other pictures of the park. The park is one of the older ones in Mesa. It's a very old park. Um, and he uh, is trying to sell it uh, largely because he does not have the financial means nor the physical health to do what it's going to take to fix the park. Um, and uh, if, he, if he can take care of his tenants the way he wants to, he can't without help. And the only way he can get help is to sell the property. Now you look at some of these pictures and, and it seems like a mix of some very nice um, units and, and some, uh, you know, we've got one right here, some very nice uh, exterior with, with a lot of plants. And then you've got some that look run down as you described. Yes, uh, and the, the concern though is not so much the aesthetics, is the safety uh, aspects of it. Uh, a lot of those units um, have some electrical issues, there's some plumbing issues, uh, some sewage issues uh, perhaps, um, and a lot of those units are far too close together uh, to meet uh, the current Mesa density codes. And so because of, of those issues, the safety uh, of the tenants the city of Mesa has, has come in and uh, decided that something needs to be done uh, to make sure that the people are safe. Now, Maria, you've been writing about this in, in a number of pieces that you've done for the Republic. This is not news. I mean, the, the condition has been there for, for some time, and, and one of the complaints that people have is, why now? Well, what set this all in motion was a complaint that the city received. The city has a complaint-based code compliance model, meaning that's basically what will set something like this in motion. They're not driving around routinely checking out properties like this. Um, so a complaint came in, I believe, in late 2013 um, regarding some construction, I believe, to a, an addition on one of the units. And so the city obviously had to respond to that um, as part of its duties. And inspections revealed, um, as Jerry was saying, tons of safety hazards, code violations, everything from electrical wiring hanging down to the units being too close together and creating a fire hazard. Um, so from that, the, the building, uh, key building official there um, issued a letter to Mr. Ham kind of outlining uh, what the issues were and giving him two options, either bring both the park and the individual units up to code or have uh, residents vacate. And that resulted in the notice? Yes, uh, later on. That uh, letter that was issued to Mr. Ham came in January of 2014. It wasn't until May that Mr. Ham uh, notified his residents of what was going on. He had tried to make some improvements, I believe around $30,000 worth, but that is only the tip of the iceberg. Those were the most immediate emergency type repairs to sort of stabilize the situation. And I understand, Jerry, the estimates are it'd be about $300,000 is what an owner would have to spend to bring it up to code. Yeah, no one's actually gone in and done a, a study of, of every single issue that there could possibly be. To take care of the electrical, to move uh, the units into a situation where they're not so dense, 
to take care of the pavement and so forth, anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand uh, dollars to to just do that much. And then once you start doing that, who knows what else you find? Uh, and that's what I think is scaring a lot of the potential buyers away. And and speaking of being scared, Enrique, uh, the the owners or the people living there are, are pretty upset. They got the notice. Uh, and they've been uh, attending hearings and so forth. Your organization is now involved. What are you guys doing? Uh, we're investigating complaints. Uh, that's what we're charged with uh, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And uh, so we got involved uh, with the impact that this is going to have on a primarily Latino uh, trailer park. Um, the people are scared. Uh, they don't know what's going on. They don't know if they're going to lose their homes. They don't know if they're going to get thrown out. They didn't know the dates. They didn't know anything of what is going on. Uh, Maria knows now a lot as she's go gone through her stories. Jerry uh, just came back from uh, 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 travels that he had and he's filled us in on some of the details, but uh, the, the uh, city hasn't been uh, forthcoming in terms of providing all of the information that they need. Uh, there are the community organizations that are involved in the picture, but uh, I've attended some meetings and I attended a meeting in which they basically said, you know, I've got some bad news for you, and it felt like they said, too bad, so sad, you know, hope, good luck. You're talking about the city. Uh, the city, right. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of criticism has been directed at the city. We do have a statement. We, we did invite them to appear on the show. They, they chose not to, but we do have a statement that uh, we're going to put up on the screen and, and I'll read for our, our listeners. Um, it says, one of the primary responsibilities of the City of Mesa is to protect the health and safety of its residents. This is accomplished not only through public safety operations such as police and fire, but also through ensuring that the infrastructure within the city's jurisdiction is maintained in a safe manner. The city has been working for more than a year with the owner of Mesa Royale to facilitate steps necessary to correct the unsafe conditions that exist on the property. Inspections of the property as well as the structures located thereon have revealed countless code violations that not only put the residents at risk but could potentially impact homes nearby. Efforts to facilitate the needed changes have not been successful resulting in the steps being taken now by the city intended to bring the physical property into compliance with building codes and also to provide residents with the requirements they must meet in order to bring their dwelling units into compliance with city code. That was provided by Stephen M. Wright, Director, City of Mesa Office of Public Information and Communications. And I should also mention that we do have a, a helpline number that the City of Mesa has provided so that people can call and, and get information. We'll put that on the screen later in the show. But, but Jerry, uh, the, the owner, uh, Mr. Ham, did ask for some time from the city to, to get things in order, uh, what, two to five years, and they said no. What happened there? Yeah, the original uh, 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 order uh, uh, provided uh, the Mr. Ham to get the park in order by July of 2015, and in December of 2015, uh, he had an individual that was interested in maintaining it as a mobile home park, but mentioned that to bring it up to code, it would take about two to five years to do so. So he sent the letter to the city requesting a two to five year extension of the deadline. Uh, to which they said, we, we can't do that. Uh, we, we've got safety hazards here, and, and that, would be, that would be negligent on our part to do so. But they did say, we'll give you till September to try to find some solution here. Um, and that has since been extended to October, and, and now as of November, uh, now it's been extended to November 24th. Um, but uh, they, they did what they could uh, to try to find somebody that would, uh, Mr. Ham did what he could to find somebody that would be able to come take it over to make all the repairs necessary, work with the tenants to, to bring their individual units up to code as well to make it a safe environment for them. And so far, we've had five, uh, five buyers and five cancellations. But you've got one right now, right? Yeah, we've got another escrow. one, and we've got another, uh, another one in line if that falls through. Uh, there, there's been no shortage of interest, but I think what happens is once they get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of everything, they figure out just how pervasive the safety concerns are and the cost it's going to take to bring those up to speed, they would rather not invest that kind of money because it, it just it won't work for them. Now, Maria, uh, the suggestion has been made that, that what the city really would prefer is that the, the park go away because this is prime real estate. It's by the light rail. It's on Main Street. Uh, and, and the city of Mesa, perhaps more than some of the other cities in the valley, has a lot of these trailer parks that are aging and something's got to be done. 
Well, in terms of uh, the claim that it's light rail related, the city from the start has denied that. I can't speak to whether that's a factor. Um, they, throughout this process, have maintained that it was the complaint that came in that set it all in motion, and they've been responding accordingly. As for the larger than average number of uh, manufactured homes in Mesa, you're completely right there. About 10, I guess over 10 years ago, um, in the 2004 housing master plan, um, that the city put together. They talked about that larger than average number of those mobile homes. Uh, in Mesa, I believe there were about 64, 63 um, manufactured home parks at the time, about 40,000 plus units. And they outlined how as those units sort of came of age or outlived what their life expectancy was supposed to be, that could create a problem um, or a series of problems. And I think we're seeing that happen now. Um, so this might not be the last that we see of these mobile home park problems in Mesa. Enrique, is there a feasible solution? Uh, November 24th isn't that far away. My understanding from the articles and from discussions we've had is that uh, there's no way these problems are going to be remedied by that date. What can be done? Well, we're trying to work uh, with various community organizations to look at the deal with housing, to look at uh, possible alternatives. Uh, the conversations have been very positive. Uh, we also have to, of course, speak with the city. Uh, I made a couple of gestures there and, and haven't gotten too far. Uh, but I think that we want to make sure that whatever is done is done in a way uh, that, they're, that the people are treated fairly, uh, with respect and with dignity. And um, that's, again, we're trying to get involved with uh, uh, economic development people. Uh, if we can get a partnership with the private sector, with uh, community organizations in the city, I think that that would be ideal. And there are ways to solve the problem. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as a former city manager, I can tell you that there are a lot of things that can be done uh, uh, to try to resolve this issue. And the right thing is to look for good alternatives. Now, I gather from some of your comments, Enrique, that, that you think that the city could have handled this better. But have you found any actual evidence of discrimination? Well, uh, overall, I can tell you that if the park were to shut down, it's going to have a disparate income, or a, a disparate impact on uh, uh, low and affordable income housing, and also it's going to have a. Dis it, they all, they are. I'd say my 99% of them are uh, Hispanic, are uh, Mexican descent. Uh, the national origin comes into play, and uh, just the impact in and of itself is is, is a lot. Now. Uh, we haven't found uh, a finding of discrimination yet. We are in the process of investigation, uh, but uh, we will continue that. And if uh, and if we find that in fact there is a discrimination going on, we will address it uh, um, through the uh, process that we have in place. So a tough situation, but there may be a, a solution that, that absolutely could work. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us on Horizonte to talk about it. In Sounds of Cultura. Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. 
While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. In Sounds of Cultura, SOC, there is a new gallery in Phoenix looking to feature artists in Arizona. Joining me to talk about this is Mario E. Diaz, owner of Francesca's Gallery. Mario, welcome to Horizonte. You're not a stranger to this set, uh, but usually when you're here, you're talking about uh, politics and other things related to your consulting business. What got you into the art world? Yeah, from, from the art of uh, politics to the art of, of real art. You know, it's, it's been a passion. Uh, I started collecting art uh, almost for, for a year. And uh, long story short, my friend owns a piece of property, and I talked to my family and, and my daughter, whom I named this gallery after, Francesca, my eight-year-old daughter. And we wanted to, to share uh, culture uh, up in that part of the central uh, Phoenix area. You know, if a city is going to develop completely, we have to have culture. And so I want to do my part through this gallery. Well, and we've got some uh, pictures of some of the pieces you have, and, you, and uh, it's just a sampling, but, sure. but you've got some beautiful pieces and some interesting artists that are involved there. The first one is a piece um, th that we have up here. Uh, tell us about that one. Well, this is a, this is a piece of work uh, uh, entitled uh, Por Donde Le Entra El Agua Al Coco? Pregúntale a Eva Mendez. And this is by Nelson uh, Garcia Miranda, and this is a saying, a Cuban saying, basically, uh, when you don't know something, you say you say the saying, and, and so he he wanted to dedicate this uh, this piece of art to uh, to Eva and, and the contribution she's made on behalf of the Cuban people. And we're talking about a, a fairly famous, very prominent actress, yeah, Eva yeah, Mendez. Very, very prominent, very very famous, and and, and the artist himself uh, came to Arizona in 1999 and and uh, was a dishwasher for several years, and unbeknownst to many, he was a very popular and famous uh, painter in, in Cuba. And so he was discovered uh, through an exhibit at Arizona State University, and now he's the resident painter at uh, the Kierlins Resort at the DeSales Restaurant. And there's another uh, connection there to the gallery directly. He used to work there. So, so when, when uh, Nelson uh, came to Arizona looking for employment, he went to the now gallery, which was a, a work center type, uh, to fill out an application. So when he came to visit the gallery to start beginning his uh, curating the, the, the gallery for his work, uh, he almost was in tears because it, memories came back to him. Tell us a little bit more about him and his prominence in Cuba before he came to the United States. Well, he was, he was, uh, he was an ambassador for Cuba, and uh, he would travel all around the world to present art to different governments. And I don't know really what happened, but... Uh, uh, he, uh, he needed to leave. Uh, so he, he left, went to Miami for a few days, and came to Arizona. And uh, he has become one of the most prominent uh, artists uh, in, in, our, in our state. But known outside of Arizona, not known here. And this is what we're trying to do at Francesca's Art Gallery, is to promote local artists. And he literally went from the uh, washing dishes at the Weston to now being their chief artist? Uh, credit to the Weston uh, Corporation that they discovered uh, uh, Nelson, and, and now he is uh, their resident artist. And he's doing quite well for the, for the hotel and for himself. We've got some more pictures we're yeah. going to put up on the screen sure. and, and talk about them, some other beautiful pieces. Yeah. Uh, and this one is, is kind of an illustration of the breadth of the kinds of art that you're displaying there. Yeah, and, and displaying and, and selling. Uh, you know, the, the art gallery is a business, and, and it's a, a business because artists uh, aren't, aren't the most adept at, at, at the business uh, side of the ledger. And so I'm trying to help them promote their, their goods. And yeah, this is a, a hand-painted wine and champagne uh, glasses that, that Nelson does, and the hotel sells these glasses, but we're selling them at the gallery also, and, and it's incredible, incredible detail that he has. You know, before we go too much further, we yeah. should say where the gallery is. Sir, the gallery is at uh, 4745 North Central uh, Avenue, right, right next to uh, Brophy and Xavier and Catholic Church, uh, centrally located uh, and uh, open to everyone. What, what are the hours? Uh, the hours are Tuesday through Saturday from uh, 10 to 5. So we've got two more pieces we want to sure. show our, our audience here. Um, 
Beautiful pieces. This is another one from, from Nelson Garcia Miranda. This is uh, one of the largest pieces. It's a 90 by 60 in dimension, uh, Guajitos. Uh, Guajito is uh, a name of, of uh, farmers in uh, the, the eastern side of, of Cuba. And what Nelson was doing, if you look closely, you'll see the eye on the left top hand side, and that's the center of the, of the painting. And you'll see figures of, of women. Uh, it was Nelson's uh, idea to paint and capture the feeling of when he was out on the fields. And so it's a big piece uh, and, and a very interesting piece. It was gorgeous. Yeah. And, we, and we've got a close up there. And yeah. finally, we've got a, a one piece by a very prominent artist whom, whom we've had as a guest on this show sure, sure. many, many times, well known, um, more for his mass, but uh, as we can see here, this sculpture by Sarko Guerrero is gorgeous. Yeah, no, Francesca's art gallery is, is just fortunate to have two of the most prominent uh, Latino artists in our state, and, and, and this piece is, is called uh, Meditation uh, by Sarko Guerrero. It's one of his a few bronze uh, works. It, it received an award in 2010 at the, at the Litchfield Park Indian Market uh, best of show, and uh, very proud to have this this piece there. Now you've got, we, we just had a sampling of, of some sure. of the beautiful pieces that, that are in the gallery. Tell us about what else people would see if, if they were to go. So uh, we have earrings by uh, Carmen Guerrero, uh, very uh, custom made earrings. We have affordable uh, pieces of work from, from Nelson uh, Garcia Miranda, and pieces that uh, quite frankly are museum uh, type. And from Zarco, we have a variety of, of masks. Uh, I think sometimes masks get underappreciated, but the art of masks is very difficult. And so Zarco, as you know, uh, studied in Japan and in Mexico. Uh, and so we have a variety of these, of these masks to, to show. And, and, and you know, we, we want to make sure that young people are also uh, get an idea of what uh, the, the world of art is about. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to uh, partner up with local schools to have students come in to, to listen to the artists, and this, this, this gallery is not just about making money for the artists or for, for us, it's about giving back to the community. And, and uh, you gave one example of how you're doing that with, with the sure. schools. What other things are you doing to reach out to the community and make this known, uh, and, and what kind of reception, literally, are, are you getting? You know, um, I, I'm new to this business, uh, to the art, art world, but I'm finding one there is just a wealth of talent out there that, that is looking for a venue to showcase their work. Two, there are people interested in, in art, but I think there's a certain stigma about entering an art gallery that it's too expensive or I'm going to be embarrassed if I ask a question. And so what we're trying to do is reach out to nonprofit organizations, uh, to community associations, to host receptions at Francesca's Art Gallery. We're, we're not charging. Want people to come because it brings traffic to to the area, but also educates people, and so it's a win-win situation for for everyone. So we're working very diligently. I spend all my mon Mondays at the art gallery dedicated to reaching out to folks because uh, you know someone said, "Why are you opening up an art gallery? It's not going to make it." Well, it's not going to make it if we don't try, if unless we try. And so I'm trying. And and why is it important to do this? I mean, we we do have art galleries, uh, most of them in Scottsdale, and and then we do have. Uh, what seems to be a fairly vibrant um, First Friday, yeah. or a little bit further south from, from where you're at, um, uh, an art scene that seems to be growing. Why, why is this important, this particular venture? Yeah, no, it's, it's important because the city of Phoenix is the sixth largest uh, city in, in the country, and, and if we're going to mature, uh, continue to mature as a city, we have to have a strong cultural aspect. And so there's never uh, enough art galleries, uh, museums. And so if we can contribute a little piece to, to, our, to our society, to our community, that's what's important to me. Now you seem to touch on this a little bit, suggested that, that maybe uh, the Latino community here is not used to going to galleries, maybe a little hesitant to yeah. do that. How are you reaching out to oh, them? I've been on, on uh, Spanish language uh, radio shows to invite the community. Uh, we're, we're trying to reach out to different churches where there's predominantly uh, Latinos that, that attend. Uh, to have, have an understanding that we should be proud of the artists that we have in, this, in, in our state. Uh, but if artists are to be known, folks need to come to the, to the gallery uh, and visualize and dream and, and think about what the, what the art represents. And what will they see in the upcoming months? I assume at some point you'll be, you'll be yeah. featuring other artists and exhibitions. So Do you know yet what's coming? I, I, I have, I have a, a vision for what I'd like. I'd like to have um, 
particularly uh, more uh, female uh, artists. Right now my first two exhibits have been uh, Zarco and, and Nelson. And so uh, one of the months I'd like to have uh, all female artists. Uh, another month is a dedication to Congressman Ed Pastor. Ed Pastor during his tenure in Congress collected a variety of pieces of work of art. So you're going to have something from him there? I'd, I'd love to have something and, there. And you're still going to be a guest on our show for political stuff, right? Absolutely. Okay, we'll have you back to talk about that and Thank your you. gallery. Thanks so much Thank for telling saying. us about that and best of luck. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte and 8. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.